BMI, we aim to bring writers and the literary imagination into the heart of public life. We do this by way of year round programs through fellowships, through student enrichment opportunities and through publications like The Believer and Witness Magazine. A few reminders before we get started. Mark your calendars. It's back from a really short hiatus. It's the last one of 2020. We're hosting a special holiday edition of The Believer's Friday Night Comics this Friday, December 4th at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Also, a reminder to please buy copies of Samantha's and Megan's books. Sam Sam's most recent, wow, no thank you, and Megan's latest is Wrong Way to Save Your Life. Links are in the chat to purchase through the writer's block. If at any point during this program you'd like to ask a question, you can do so by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, not to be confused with the chat icon, but we hope that you are all also active in the chat. Now a bit about our special guests. Samantha Irby is a writer whose work you can find on the internet. She writes a blog called Bitches Gotta Eat and has written three books, Meaty, We Are Never Meeting in Real Life, and Wow, No Thank You. Megan Seelstra is the author of three collections, Everyone Remain Calm, Once I Was Cool, and The Wrong Way to Save Your Life. She is currently a Shearing Fellow with us at BMI here in Las Vegas. And she tells me, and she tells me that she met Samantha Irby telling stories on stage at the Green Mill in Chicago, where they were both probably drunk. Please help me welcome Megan Steelstra and Samantha Irby. Hi, everyone. Um, just really quick, before we get started, I, I wanted to take a moment and acknowledge the history that we are living in right now. There is an international health crisis, there's a whiplash of an election, there's a racial uprising centuries in the making, and there are the deeply personal mountains that everybody's moving every day. I, I know that some of you here are trying to make art. I know that some of you here are trying to make rent. I know some of you are involved in organizing and rapid response and you're caring for others, including seniors and small children and people whose health is affected by COVID. And in the midst of all of this work and fear and change, I hope you're caring for yourselves a little bit too. Uh, Sam and I met talking smack at the Paper Machete Live News Magazine in Chicago and all I've wanted to do to care for myself the past few months is sit with her in the back booth at the Green Mill with a bottle or two or five of wine and talk about how to keep writing in the midst of all of this. And I wanted to thank the Black Mountain Institute for giving this conversation a home and also for taking such good care of my son and I over the past six months. I also wanna throw some special love at Sada Ortiz, Lily Allen, Layla Muhammad, and all the booksellers, literary directors, and festival producers who are working like mad behind the scenes, making these online spaces for us to talk about stories and language and why they so desperately matter in this beautiful, complicated shit show of a world. Uh, Sam, hi, I miss you. Hi, I miss you hi. a lot. The I last... feel like you were one of the last people I saw before everything really went nuts. All of the things. Well, the last time you and I had a public conversation like this, it was the release party for Wow No Thank You. And it was a week into lockdown. Nobody knew what the hell was going on. Nobody had any idea how to use Zoom. Y'all, do you remember like your yeah. life before you knew Zoom? Those um, early, I remember I was working in Chicago on season two of, oh my God, work in progress uh, as everything was like blowing up and they were like, we're mm -hmm. gonna send everybody home and we'll work on Zoom. And I was like, what is Zoom? <laughs> and, that, and now like Zoom's like a thing. It's like a verb mm -hmm. and everyone knows, you know, about Zooming. But back then it was like, Mm -hmm. what is this thing that's going to connect us all? Mm -hmm. uh, and now it's like the only tool that mm -hmm. connects us all. Yeah. The very I first time. Zoom too much fucking credit, but. I know. I, I think it's fair because like, it's the one, <laughs> it's the one way that we're reaching out and making these connections right now. Although I'm really interested in how it affects um, our private and public conversation. Like right now I am looking at my screen and all I see is me and you, which mm -hmm. is very similar to the conversations you and I just have on FaceTime when mm -hmm. there are not 200 other people watching us. Uh, yeah, so we have to be careful and not like- Do well, we? The thing, I, I think the thing that helps me is that if I were just talking to you, I wouldn't have like put on a nice shirt. Um, it, that is a nice shirt. You do look pretty so fabulous. I, it keeps me from saying everything I would say without an audience 
to because I look down and I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, it's not just you and her. Look at your nice shirt. There's other people here. <clears throat> but does it? Like I'm thinking about I'm thinking about everything that I've ever read of your work ever. And how do you make like how are you making choices like this about what's public and what's private? I mean. Well, I think for me in general, the line is I would never say anything about anyone else, you know, like my wife who's across the room. I can't talk shit about her with all these people (laughs) watching. But other than that, you know, like other than being like, God, this bitch is getting on my nerves. I kid, I'll, I just say everything. Mm -hmm. Who am I kidding? What, what privacy? Right. Well, but do you, because we've had, so, so at the beginning, we talked about the first public conversation or the last public conversation we had, Mm -hmm. and that was for the release party. But really the last conversation we actually had was in the group text where we were talking about my divorce and you were asking me about my sex life since I got to Las Vegas. (laughs) And, and so that is not a thing I would bring up in this forum, in this public forum. Thank you. That's, you know, like thank said, you for letting me do that all by myself, right? Right. Yeah. But it's I don't inter- bring up other people's shit, just mm-hmm. mine. Right. But I'm wondering, like, is it a good thing that that maybe we're getting more personal in these conversations? Like, how is it different for you to sit down and talk to me right now on Zoom, right now, after we've been through the past eight months we've had, and the first time we did this back in, you know, beginning of April, when our particular intention of getting together to talk was because you were trying to promote a book during a pandemic. What was the beginning of the, Megan, you can't give me these long questions. I'm too stupid. Okay. What was the beginning of the question? All right, New York Times bestseller. And today, New York Times best of 2020. I'm not ever going to take a disclaimer like that again. With no listening comprehension. You know, if I were there, I would punch you in the, actually, I'm going to invite Kristen to like punch you in the arm for me right now. Um, Yeah, she will. She wants to actually wait and sit if she's going to do it, but I'm going to, you know, we'll we'll move on. She doesn't need a reason. Trust me. Okay, okay. Yes, when we fine, when right? we talked when we talked like straight up April first, mm-hmm. and I'm just I'm just trying to imagine like what you were experiencing at that time. Like your your book came out that day. You were supposed to be going on a nationwide tour. You had this huge promotional schedule, mm-hmm. and everything immediately went online. Actually, can we talk about that before we get to the question? I can subtext. Yes. I can hold it. Okay, w- what has it been like for you the past six months trying to move a book in the world? Let me tell you, part of part of the feeling, I, I think for any creative person, particularly people who do what I do, um, there's always like the nagging thing in the back of my mind that's like, who wants this? Mm-hmm. Or who needs this thing that I'm doing? Or like, don't, it's rhetorical. I mean, I know you do, but I have to sell to people more than you to get book deals right Mm -hmm. so I like I always have that general like who needs this who wants this does is this gonna make anybody's day better and like my goal I think with all of my work is just like to make people laugh women especially but to make people laugh Mm -hmm. in a pandemic (laughs) the question of like who needs this or wants this or is this a thing I should be doing right now is like magnified by a factor of 10, right? Cause it's mm-hmm. like real shit is happening. Does anybody need a joke book about like farts or whatever mm-hmm. during this time? So in the beginning I was very like, mm-hmm. but like the book's already like written and printed. And at that point, the contract I have entered into with my publisher is like, girl, you got, oh, the check cleared. You got to go sell this book. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, I was very tentative. Like, um, I know people are on ventilators, but if you're not, and you're alone in your apartment and you want to like, want my voice in your head, here is, uh, this book for you. Like it felt 
sort of gross. And there's no way unless like you talk to every single person. And I think I said it in everything I was doing on the tour or every stop I did on my virtual tour. I was like, I understand the, the gravity of everything that's happening. But if you want a little pain medicine, you can buy this book and it'll make you laugh. I think, and then after a while, it was like, oh, and people were buying it and, and the, mm-hmm. the response was good. I was like, okay, it's not, it, it's less bad than I feel to be out kind of like banging the drum of buy this thing. Cause it's just, I mean, I haven't written that many books but I certainly have never written a book when like millions of people are out of work Mm -hmm. And like, I'm selling them a thing, you know, if there was a vaccine in every copy of the book, I'd be, (laughs) I'd be on the news trying to sell it. Mm -hmm. But it was, so in the beginning, it was like, really like, who wants this? Is this necessary? Am I a ghoul for trying to sell Mm -hmm. it? And then once like, there was a good response, I was like, I might still be a ghoul, but at least it's working. (laughs) It's working. That, that might be one way to say it. And another way to say it might be thinking about the what our lives actually mean and being able to find a little bit of joy in it. And I think, yeah. it, you know, it can give a million reasons to back this well, up. So then, that, you, mean, no, 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 I, you, I'm, you let me compliment you. I'm going to compliment you first. No, no, you I'm, and, I'm not going to detract I, from your compliment. I okay, do. then let me make it. Let me make it first. Let me make okay, it first. And it, like anywhere from like the 200 people in the space right now talking about how much they need your work. Anything from the New York Times calling you the bard of the pandemic because holy shit, people just need to laugh. But, but also- that's the thing though, like I'm gonna need a pandemic every time I put a book in. <laughs> oh girl, no. Cause we're always gonna need it. We are always gonna need it. Whether it is in the literature that we're reading but also just that feeling when you need it from the people closest in your life, case in point. Um, us talking about, you know, the text message earlier about my, sex life, like that turned into a conversation about whether or not I needed to go sleep with a cowboy here in Vegas. And then that turned into a conversation of whether or not I needed to go sleep with the whole rodeo. And then I was sitting in my kitchen here in Las Vegas, laughing and laughing and laughing. And oh my God, I needed to laugh. I needed that so much. I am very good at that, at the like, things are bleak. Someone (laughs) say a thing that makes me laugh I am very good at that so I suppose like as long as people have problems there will always be a lane for me to like stick myself in there and be like uh can I prescribe this dumbass book for you to read and it'll help you feel better but what I was gonna say when I almost cut you off was that and you can probably relate to this too when you do what we do but it's not self-help that's yeah. another thing that's like, how do you sell your thoughts to people? I'm, and maybe this is a general question, but like convincing someone to sit down and read the things you think about mm-hmm. and like, there's no solution to anything. You know, at the end of the book, you're not going to close it and be like, now I know how to grow my wealth or whatever. Like that, that's, that's hard in general, but I feel like in this specific pandemic time, I was like super intimidated mm-hmm. by, I mean, thankfully I didn't have to physically like go places to try to convince people, right? Like I could just sit in my dining room and, and hope I could convince them. I didn't have to face any like real mm-hmm. <laughs> rejection which which is good but I don't know it's an unprecedented I mean how many times can I say that word but it's an unprecedented time and I feel like I made the most of it Mm -hmm. but again that's not the kind of thing you can like brag about without Mm -hmm. looking like a piece of shit so you know like I know you guys had a horrible pandemic but I was okay like you can't you know you can't, I'm lucky that I adapted and that I didn't write a book about infectious disease or 
people dying or anything scary. Like I wrote a book to make people laugh about going to the bathroom, but it was rough. It was rough. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't want to do it again. (laughs) Well, um, hopefully there is no more pandemic and you won't have to do it again. Um, But I'm... uh, I'm, I'm thinking about how, like you talking about how it's, it's just fart jokes. And I, I would love to, to dig a little bit deeper into that. Mm-hmm. And again, coming back to our conversation earlier. And again, I, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones who has your number, right? Like I can, like I can show up on your back porch and I, I mean, which I, which I do fairly often again. We hi, just got hi, a Kirsten. big outdoor heater. Um, Fantastic. Good. I'm going to live on your back porch when I move back from Vegas. It'll be perfect. Um, But I think that the feeling that I have with you is something that other people feel too when they connect with with your work. Um, And I think it's more than farting and pissing and and the laughing, although that's a huge part of it, right? I'm thinking of after we had that whole conversation about me and the rodeo, you came back into the conversation and said, yeah, but hey, how are you really? Mm-hmm. And that's you just as much as the yeah. go fuck a rodeo, right? And so me asking me that, like, that's the point where I could sit down and cry because this is hard. This is, this is hard mm-hmm. here. Um, and, and to have you ask that and to be that person in my life. And you're not just that person for me, right? Your yeah. books do that. Your books do that too. So I'm, I'm interested in, in, Maybe you talking a little bit about your work and, and when when do you wanna put the humor down and go a little deeper into it? Like I'm thinking of the My Mother, My Daughter essay specifically from Meaty. Um, I know humor is a place where you start, but there is also like, what, what do the kids say on the internet? You have the range. <laughs> First of all, my stepchildren let me know that I do not know anything the kids <laughs> say. So, I don't even try. <laughs> like, okay. I don't know what's cool. I know what I say and maybe it's wrong, but I have I have no idea. Um, I have such a deep well of self-loathing. And I think one of the things I try to do or one of the things, I think the way it influences my writing is that I am always like yearning for people to like me or connect with me. Um, I think that's like the root of everything I have ever written is that whoever is on the reading end of it is like, this is a person who I'd like or like to spend time with or whatever. And naturally, I, ju- I do care about how people are doing. And I think because I spent so like, you know, I had a horrible childhood and like so much of it was spent with people who should have asked how I was doing, not asking that I think that a thing uh, like it's like a conscious thing like uh, you know I'm not gonna be corny in my writing and be like reader how are you you getting through the day okay you know what I mean who the nobody fucking wants that they don't want that from me but what I do think is like I want to talk to people and I think I do like they're my friends and I feel like if you have Maybe not the first thing you read, but if you have read more than one thing I've written, I feel like we have a relationship and I always talk to people from that place. You know what I mean? So it's less like, you know, like I'm not being condescending and looking down and being like, (laughs) hope you're okay, person who spent $14 $14 on my book. Like I'm talking from like underneath the bottom of the floorboards where I, you know, like a troll I'm, or, you know, like a 
troll goblin under a bridge. And I'm like, ah, thank you for buying this book. I hope you're okay. I love you. You know, it's like a much more like desperate yearning, longing kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, in t- and like the humor of it all. So that was like the, the friend part, like the, the wondering if the audience is okay and the hoping the audience is okay. And it, I probably should say that a thing I, I always want to do is be relatable. Um, Cause like I'm a real person and I feel like Sometimes when we talk to each other, we are like our avatars instead of our our real selves. So I always want to do that. But I do, the goal of my writing is always, even if it's at my expense to get someone to laugh or get someone to feel less alone or uh, get someone to feel like there is a person that they don't actually know, but they kind of know who's like, going through the same things they are or feeling the same things they do. So like, ultimately I just want to like connect with people and like make them laugh and, Mm -hmm. uh, and also have some of my like most idiotic experiences, not, not be in vain. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I got dumped, but I took that and made a story that made people laugh so uh it was worth it um the humor I my natural now I could probably have an amazing answer for you if I went to therapy but I don't so Mm. you're gonna get my untherapy answer which is that the only way I have ever been able to process grief trauma small slights is to find the nugget of ridiculousness, the silver lining of what um, makes it funny and just cling to that with all my might to kind of like take the teeth out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's it's always interesting to me what, the things that people are surprised like I can write about with humor. Like, you know, my mom died 22 years ago, 23 years ago, something like that. And when there's that much space, right? Like I can laugh. So that's like not hard (laughs) for me to write, but I'm gonna tell you a thing. I don't even think I've talked about this, but I'm gonna tell you a thing that was hard for me to write that most people probably wouldn't think. I wrote in brief about like when Kirsten and I were first dating, I came to this house, which is now our house, but at the time it was only her house. And she had like a brunch and I met all of her friends and (laughs) she had this chair that like unfolds and something was wrong with the chair. Doesn't matter what, but it broke while I was fucking sitting on it at this table full of people. And then I had to like, you know, do the thing where you like, like a movie, you claw your way up, like one hand slamming on the table and trying to like pull myself up. That moment was horrifying in, in hindsight, like funny, ridiculous, whatever. But like telling the world that I fucking broke a chair was more devastating than anything I've ever written about mm-hmm. like my mom mm-hmm. so and, but and, but even that it's like funny it's just it's how I process all of it it like is all the same and I gotta find the jokes to get through it and that was in the 911 emergency essay right from well yes, thank you right Right, because I yellow book. I'm not sure. I there, it's it's in no, because I because no, it's in this one because I just read it this morning. So I like I like I'm a you scholar. So like I've got all this stuff down, but um, but I want to tell you that on my um desktop I have a doc called 911, and this past year has this past year has been hard for everybody, hard for me for all sorts of other personal reasons, mm-hmm. and I have my own 911 list going just for me it's not a thing that I'm ever but just like that frame is giving me a way to 
help with my own head and heart a little yeah. bit. And so I want to just put the, like, bring this right back to you saying before about wanting, wanting your work to, to, to help people connect or not feel alone in, in some kind of a way and like achievement unlocked, you know, in, in preparation for this conversation, I saw a lot of like marketing going around saying that, you know, Megan and Sam, we're going to try to guide you through these difficult times. And I read that and I was like, holy shit, how, I don't even know, I don't know how, how that's going to happen. But then when I, when I was, when I was rereading Wano, thank you this morning, I got to this part in your acknowledgement section and you said, I would like to thank the many adopted families that allow me to call them my own who let me stay with them and use up all their shit and call me in the middle of the night and put garbage on their credit cards when I need to. And I would also like to thank every single person I've ever met in my entire life, even the assholes. And mm -hmm. if there's any, I love that. You're like, mm, yeah, that was good. <laughs> but <laughs> well, I, I think- I you know, much better when you read them. <laughs> but I, no, honestly, I, I think like that connected to what you were just saying about how we need points of connection in this mess right now. Like that's- Mm -hmm. it, like if there's any Megan and Sam try to guide us through anything like I, you were that you've been that for me this year yeah. you've been the person on the other end of my text messages and you've been the person calling me when I was in Chicago saying I need you to come to my house in Michigan right now please come get into your car let my wife cook for you Kirsten mm -hmm. thank you very much again still I love you um <laughs> uh, so I, like if there's a takeaway it's that it's let other people help you um yeah, I mean, that has been a fundamental, I mean, Kirsten and I were just talking about, like, I would not have survived if I hadn't, I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, but however you want to frame it, I mean, I had the kind of life where I needed people to help me, and, you know, closed mouths don't get fed, so I learned early that you got to ask for what you need and again like just to bring it back to the book for a second it's just like everything I put in it is sort of like <laughs> um offering help for someone who might not have asked for it but maybe like that's what they need like the hello 911 it's like a bit ultimately right like it's got a formula and it's like a bit but it's me Rather than writing, you know, I'm an extremely anxious person. I take all these meds. I'm super mentally ill. I'm depressed, you know, wah, wah, wah. I figured out a way to write about it that was humorous that, and I think is maybe relatable. And maybe people don't have words for, maybe people who don't know that they're anxious can read a thing about like freaking out in the... <laughs> the uh, uh, toll thing like and be like oh that happens to me too mm -hmm. maybe I maybe this is like this is funny and this person is a mess but also maybe I have some anxiety that I have to deal with I mean I'm always just trying to, you know in my own little way to solve mm -hmm. a problem no one asked me to fix mm -hmm. and usually it's just the problem of like make me laugh but sometimes it's also like, oh, thank you for writing about how, you know, growing up as a black kid, no one lets you be depressed, at least in the 80s. <laughs> they didn't. So, you know. I have been thinking a lot lately about the form of the personal essay in the world right now. And especially like how it's a study of like the growth of a person's life over time, right? Like I can look at meaty and then I can look at we're never meeting in real life. And I can look at, wow, well, no, thank you. And see how you've changed over this time. I'm, I'm thinking about this a lot right now because I'm, I've, I made a book called once I was cool a few years back and it, it's, it, I resold the rights. So the new one, the new edition of it is coming out this summer. Oh, you didn't tell me that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Bitch. We'll talk about that more on text message, but, but here's the super literary reason why I'm talking about it right now. Um, it's, it's about the first five years of my marriage and when my kid was born and this very happy time and, and, and I'm processing that in different ways right now. Right. So like to have to look back at that time is really, is, mm -hmm. is complex and loaded. And, um, and, and this is just kind of the, the setup for, for what I'd, I'd, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to do with me next and, and ju just to see, to see what happens here. I found in my notes app, oh. uh, I know 
a list. It, okay, so we it's dated December 2013. Okay. So, so everything that's on it is pre-2013. Okay. The title of this list is Top Five Samantha Irby Vagina Commentary in no oh, particular no. order. Oh yeah. I yeah. need to tell everyone who's watching that I had no idea this was happening. So we're about to go on. Oh this no, but but don't together. don't you love how I'm framing it? Like in the like Please thinking about the greater meaning of the essay and, and how and how this fits. Okay. All right. So I am going to redo these just one by one. And I want you to tell me like what you think of it right now. Like, is it still true for you? Okay. Okay. Right? Okay. All right. Number one, this is from Bitch Magazine. With a dozen keystrokes, my blind date has unfettered access to the last four years in the life of my vagina. Some people can handle it. Most people cannot. True. Especially men. I dated so many people who like, and this was before I was even anything, right? Like when I just had a blog on the internet who could not handle that there was like a chronicle of my mostly non-existent sex life online. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm going to say that's still true. Like if Kirsten mm -hmm. dumped me tomorrow, and here's the thing, I don't ever want to like have sex with a man again. So this is probably moot because like women just probably wouldn't care, but mm -hmm. I feel like people would be like, uh, mm -hmm. right. I don't know. <laughs> I don't right. know if I can be with you and have my like business in the street, which yeah. I understand. Yeah. But I'm wondering too, like, even if, even if we pull, pull out of the vagina is just a sentence that I said <laughs> in a public forum. Um, and like, not even thinking about it. Uh, why would you? <laughs> Well, I don't know. We're figuring out new things all of the time. Um, like, but just thinking about what it means as a personal essayist that like when we meet a new person for the first time, they have access to all sorts of things. Like, oh. like a woman, this is years ago, but like a person came up to me on the, on the L in Chicago and was like, you're Megan Steelstra. And I was like, Yes, like, like I'm, I'm thinking of the, I, I just, I just reread your essay. Are you familiar with my work, right? And I was like, I am, I am Megan Steelstra. And she went, I have an IUD also. And I was like, oh, oh, and it's one of those things that like, like we, we, we put these stories out into the world and then they don't belong to us anymore. They belong to whoever carries them. Uh, I'm going to say something maybe controversial. I don't think it's controversial, but okay. I like to be all 240 I like to, of us are leaning forward. Right I like now. to be spicy. No, no, no. It's not even juicy. It's just like an indication of like the deep, like just my deep sadness or whatever, my loneliness. I like love that. I love that people who meet me now, lots of people have never heard of me. It's not like meeting Tom Cruise and you're like, oh, tell me about the alien overlord. It's not like that. But like people who meet me now who've read my stuff. So like I can't walk down the street without somebody like throwing a maxi pad or a diaper at me <laughs> but it does okay let's talk about like my diarrhea right you I don't ever again have to spend time with anyone who doesn't know that I got to go take a shit right yeah and it I don't have to explain I don't have to apologize I can be like you know what's up I'm going to the bathroom for 20 minutes don't come in and it's like it's a huge relief I, no one has used anything against me yet although I feel like I could I'm charming enough to like talk my way out of it but it is it's like a relief to just have people already know and if you don't want to fuck with me then you're not like, you're probably not going to, like, meet me or hang out with me. We don't, now, I have to decide if I like you and like spending time around you. I'm such a fucking egomaniac that if you like my stuff, I'm probably going to love you. <laughs> so that's, that's the way to be in my life is to be like, girl, that thing you wrote, and then I'll fucking give you a kidney. But 
I, uh, it's like, a somebody re- please put that on Twitter for me right it's, now. Okay. Go ahead. Sam. It's a relief. It's a relief okay. for me. All right. To, to just have, just to already have some shit out of the way. You know what I, uh, like my biggest desire, I hope someone is like psychoanalyzing this. My biggest desire, and you would think like with all this shit that I've been saying that I didn't have any friends, but like I do, but my biggest desire is to like fast forward past the part where you don't know someone and like just get deep into it. Like I don't want to do the pleasantries and maybe that's why so many uh, I'm still friends with so many people that I went to high school with. It's like, I don't like, it's so hard to go through 40 years worth of shit, especially my shit, right? Where I have to be like, okay, buckle in. My parents were old and they were sick. Then they died. Before then, there was lots of abuse and blah, blah, blah. <gasps> went to college, dropped out. You know what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. uh, it's just nice to have some of that shit out of the way. You know, I feel like I, I need a cigarette. After that. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm just, just for the sake of time, I'm going to, I'm going to keep us moving just because oh, I know that there are a million questions that other people want to oh, ask you, but God. you and I, you and I are going to get back into the group text later and keep going yeah. on this one. Okay. Two. Wait, I feel like all these things need to be relevant to writing. Cause I feel like there are people watching this being like, who cares about your life? Um, so essayists, that is a way. <laughs> to <laughs> meet people in the world and that's a that's a way writing about yourself in intimate detail is a, in it's not an easy way but it is a way to uh jump the initial relationship hurdles with a person yep and right now there are 20 20- editors on this thread who are going to write you tomorrow and ask for the craft essay that you just named in that last sentence. So just get ready. I mean, you know, I'll write anything for money. So. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Let me, let me go to number two. Let me go to number two, two. (laughs) Let me go to number two. Just kidding. But, um, okay. So this is from an interview that you did with Claire Zolke. Sidebar (laughs) y'all. Claire is a Chicago writer. We love her. She is hosting the Churbies tomorrow night. That's the, um, it's the Chicago Writers Awards dinner that's set up through the Chicago Review of Books that is such an awesome publication and an organization. And they lift up Chicago writers, which is where Sam and I started. And we love them a ton, a ton, a ton. It's called the Churbies. Can I tell you something? Yep, yes. Claire and I went to high school together. Of course, see, we always just keep, it all comes back to Evanston. Evanston, Illinois, all right. (laughs) <laughs> this is what you said to Claire. Uh-oh. My boss is cool. He doesn't give a fuck about any of my vagina talk as long as I show up every single day. But the problem is, is that he can never die. <laughs> Discuss. My boss, who I still call my boss, even though I don't work for him. He's like my dad. I still talk to him. And... That's the truth. He didn't, at one point, I think this was maybe like right before the original meaty came out. And I was like writing my blog on my lunch break and then writing the book on my lunch break. And at one point, and he and I were like, you know, I worked for him for 14 years. But we, there's no secrets. When you work for somebody for 14 years, like, you know, he may as well like be my brother. So at one point I was like, yo, I'm, I was going to be in the Chicago Tribune and I was like, listen, okay, I'm going to be in the paper. They're going to like ask where I work. Does any of this bother you? Like, you know, I just write this raunchy shit online. Do you care? And he was like, no, I don't. And he didn't. I'm now he I mean he doesn't give a fuck. Mm-hmm. I write about him. He's like, mm-hmm. whatever. I always like thank him like last in my acknowledgments, like that where you put the real important. Mm-hmm. Well, no, I thank you first. So I can't say that the important people go at the end, but I always do a little thing for him at the end of my books. Like he is a person who 
Okay, let's, this is a craft thing. I'll keep it short. One of the things, one of the reasons I have this career is because I had a job. Like my first book got published when I was like 33, 35, somewhere, 32, somewhere in there, right? So all those years I had to like work and that gave me the ability to like take my time and wait for shit to happen because I never had to depend on my writing to pay me. Mm-hmm. That's just a burden. It never had to support my life. And so that took like the burden off of me and thank God for him. He, I mean, truly, I came to work hungover. I came to work in the same clothes <laughs> as the day before. Cause I had gone home with some dude and he never said shit. All my checks were on time. He always paid my insurance. He's the best. He's mm-hmm as big a part of why I'm able to do this as mm-hmm. I am, yep. you know? I know there are people listening on this call right now who you you run your own business, right? You have employees who work with you. Please like hang on to this uh, <laughs> and just be aware of, of what they're making and what they might accomplish. Yeah, and I'm, I'm like here today for the same if reason. They write about their pussy hole on the internet, let them cook. This is so you and me, Sam, like I say the thing and then you say the truth, right? Like, this is good. This is, this is us three. This is from an interview. I could not find the source of it. All right. I tried today. All right. All right. I, okay. Hold on. It's one single sentence. So I need to, I need to stretch. When people say women aren't funny, what they're really saying is that joy and pleasure and the agency to affect someone in that primal and profound way is the province of men. And it is simple and misogynistic in the most basic way and quite possibly the most untrue thing ever. Did I plagiarize that? No, you said that. You said that. Send that to me. I can't I will. I put those words together. Yeah. I mean, I've had two glasses of wine, so I may have read them in a different emphasis than you usually do, but you did not have a period in there. Well, that shit is true. I mean, are we still having the women aren't funny argument? Are people still saying that? We're not. Right. I just feel that's always just like such a bad faith argument. And like, if a woman has never made you laugh, like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for you, but like the blanket statement that women aren't funny is bananas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Four. This is from Meaty. And I have to say, I I remember when I first read that line, when the first edition of Meaty came out, and this was one of the lines that like, I set the book down and like cheered by myself. (laughs) Um, But I also wanna say that when I reread it this morning, uh, I cried. And this is nothing new because I cry on Zoom all the goddamn time right now, but um, I, I, it's making me think about how a piece of literature stays with us for an extended period of time. And as we grow, the words mean different things to us for different Mm -hmm. reasons. Here's the line. Um, I'm not bitter. I survived a liar. I'm not bitter. I weathered a cheater. I'm not bitter. I sustained a massive injury to the giant bloody muscle in the center of my chest that is responsible for pumping blood through my entire body. I, it's, it's so interesting. Well, I know why that resonates with you, but it's interesting to think about like the headspace I was in when I wrote that it was, I was writing it for, so at the time I only had this blog and I was writing it for this book. And at the time, I mean, we don't even have time to get into like the indie publisher of it all. (laughs) and our experiences with that indie publisher. But at the time it was like, I was writing this book for no money, right? There was no advance. I wasn't even sure there was gonna be a book. So I really was like, 
I'm going to write this one book and it's going to be the only thing I put out in the world and blah, blah, blah. What do I want to say? And one of the things I wanted to say, I had had a lot of like, not pushback, but like comments on my blog and stuff at the time that I allowed comments. <laughs> But like from men, I assume who were like, oh, you're so bitter. You no just comments. Men. And it's like, man, it is so, e it's so much easier to call someone bitter than to ask them about the truth of their experience. And it's like, I understand that like, it's, it's so weird that we have this thing culturally where it's like, you need to bounce back. And it's like, okay, that takes time. But if during the bouncing back time, I speak frankly about this thing that I've gone through, it's, it's so weird to me because you would never tell someone to like get over it with death, right? You, no one ever told me to like get over my mom dying, which is wild because I did. I went to work the day after my mom died. So like, it's so weird that when you sustain a heartbreak specifically, which is like a big, like full body experience. Like it's, it just is, I mean, anything that, that I feel like culturally people view as like the purview of women is just like, you know, made smaller and smaller and you're, you're made to feel mm -hmm. shame about it. But like, no one would ever tell you, get over that big heart. Like, get back on the horse. Like, give me, let me like find my sea legs first. So I really wanted, if this was going to be the only book I ever put out into the world, I really wanted to like stand up for those of us who like feel bad when bad things happen to us. And I think that's been like a theme throughout my work to varying degrees where it's just like, can't, let, can't let's feel that for a minute. And I hate for anyone to have anything I, other than like a child throwing a tantrum to have any legitimate feeling of yours written off by people who won't even like pause for a second to ask you what it is you're going through fills me with rage. I still feel like that. I am allowed to be, and so are all of us, a lot. You mean mad or bitter or upset for as long as you fucking want. I'm, you're allowed, you're allowed. So I just wanted to like, you know, I, I think that's in that essay, I don't really eat this much salad, which is about like, <laughs> like ending a breakup and being like, okay, I don't have to like buy fancy water so that this person thinks I'm a person who buys fancy water. Or I don't, I don't have to do all of these things anymore. And one of the things like I don't, I don't have to do is like pretend that my feelings aren't hurt. Isn't it nuts the way we just like so casually like <laughs> cast people's feelings aside? Like that is an insane, insane thing to me. And I just wanted to get it down for anyone, any future generations of people who are being told like, get over it. I'm, sure, you know, <laughs> okay, but not yet. You know, you can hang on to that for as long as you want to. And it's not like a feeling isn't just, you know, people like act like feelings are indulgent, but you really feel them, right? Like I get stressed out, my fucking stomach hurts, my head hurts, I get sore, you know, all that kind of thing. Like it, it there is a physical manis manifestation of your feelings. So just to like, like, I'm not going to get over a headache without some Tylenol. If bitching about my old boyfriend is my Tylenol, then let me have my Tylenol. And by Tylenol, I mean heroin, because that's what I need. I love you a lot. I love you a lot. <clears throat> Number five. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this is from Bitches Gotta Eat. Okay. And I want to okay. just real quick, like <laughs> hands up in the chat who first came to Sam's work from the blog she started over a decade ago. And let's acknowledge that this morning when that book was listed as the best of 2020 in the New York Times, I don't want anybody on here to tell you that there's only one path to being a writer. Right. No. What you need to do is say what's true to you and the way that is true to you. Your voice, your ideas, your experiences matter. They matter. We need them. We need you. We are trying to remake the world here. Number five, my vagina's name is Rap Beefs. <laughs> Was that the thing? I went to uh, like a. Uh... Oh, God. Yes, I Rap Beefs. To... I went to like speed dating with someone's mom or no, we went to a workshop and you had to name your vagina. Your vagina? Oh my God. First of all, I want to say someone's comment just popped up that they invested in my teeth and thank God for you. Remember when I was dying? Cause I, I just had to have like a jaw surgery. This is, my body is made of garbage, but that, speaking of my body being made of garbage, I, at that thing, at that seminar or whatever, said my vagina's name was Rat Beast. And they were like, get the fuck out of here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. I can't believe I you are making me listen to my own oh my God. 2009 words. Honey, this I can do this for hours and hours and hours. All right, listen, but other people have questions. Here's one thing I want to say real quick before I bounce to the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam and I are here like not just here at Black Mountain, but like here in the world because of independent bookstores. We love them so much yeah, and they do. need us so much and we need them. Um, my local here in Las Vegas right now is the writer's block. Sam, your local in Kalamazoo is the book bug, right? Yeah. Is the I book bug. That. And then both of us are in love with women and children first and volumes and the bookseller and semicolon in Chicago. Um, so if you're enjoying this conversation at all, maybe what you can do after you're done is just bounce to one of those bookstores or bounce into your local and get yourself a book or two or five or 10 uh, so we can kind of keep lifting up these institutions. All right, Sam, here's okay. the question. This is for both of us, but I'm gonna volley it to you because I'm still kind of having a, a very profound re emotional response for the TED talk that you just gave me about my life. Okay, have you been writing non-COVID related work during the pandemic? If so, how are you balancing living in the pandemic and writing separate work? Yes, um, not much. Yes, I've been writing my daily, <laughs> not always daily newsletter about Judge Mathis and I also just sold uh, three more books. What? So get ready. What? Get ready. Okay, wait, wait, that. Say, say, say that last sentence again. I just sold three more books. Future books. But here's the thing. Please know, everyone, that I'm doing it with the same publisher. And so, like, they know me and literally, like, I just wrote like on a napkin, Sam. I would like to write more books. And they were like, okay. So I don't know what they're about. I don't know what's going to be in them, but Sam, over like we're, two, 2022, 2024 and 2026, if the asteroid doesn't relieve me of this miserable life, uh, there will be new books from me unless I breach my contract. So I will- Wait, say, wait, 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 let me say- Breaking news from the Black Mountain Institute in Las Vegas. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, I have been, I have mostly not written COVID things, um, mostly because like, I feel like the real stories need to come from people who had it or worked on the front lines or were affected by it. And so far, I'm gonna knock on this wood table. I haven't been, but also, and here's, this is gonna go back to one of your early questions. If it's not my personal experience, I have a hard time making fun of shit. And like the, the nugget of COVID that was funny and that I did write about and is gonna be in the book is how I was working in Chicago 
they told us uh, that we had to vacate this like pr- this place we were living in. Like all the writers for the show were living in this building and they were like, y'all gotta get the fuck out and go wherever you're gonna go, but you can't stay here. And it was in the early days of COVID when it was like, you don't touch anything without spraying it or, or whatever. So I had to drive to back to Michigan from Chicago. And I was like freaking out because I was like, how do I get gas without touching shit? So that's a little COVID piece, but I can like that. And that's the beauty of being funny. I am saying too many things, but one of the beauties of writing funny stuff is it lets me off the hook for serious shit. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to write about fucking politics. Are you out of your mind? Like, no, I'm just a little joke monkey. So I don't have to write about super serious things unless they involve me and I can make them funny. Okay. There are a metric ton of questions here. I'm going to make sure, I, I want to make sure that we hit two in the next four minutes. There's, okay. there, there, oh, there's two of them. There's two of them uh, that my, that my, time. I that my whole soul. And I know. Well, I'm just going to like, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to call you when we get off this. Okay. There's more. <laughs> okay. All right. What is your writing ritual? It's longer than that, but let's just answer it that way. Uh, wait until there's a deadline and <laughs> write desperately in the middle of the night. Okay. I'm going to throw in uh, this, this next book is due in December of 2021. And you know, when I'm going to start it in earnest, December of 2021. Um, I'm going to need the first essay for that book by February, 2021 in my inbox. Oh, Kirsten, write that down. Kirsten. He's upstairs with the dog. Okay. Um, (laughs) y'all Sam got a dog, even though she wrote in her last book that she would never get a fucking dog. She did it because she grows. Okay. This question is vital. This is vital. This is so important, Sam. This is my whole soul. But actually, before I ask this one, I want to answer the last one about writing ritual, um, because this is a different writing ritual than what Sam just said. And I think all sorts of writers have different rituals and you get to find yours. Can we we go over the time a little bit or does this, do we turn into pumpkins? Maybe we'll go over just a little bit and Sada will still love me. I love you, Sada. Okay. Okay. Um, The dog's name is Abe. I saw someone ask that. It's Abraham. Yeah. And, and it's not just a dog. It's like one of the little dogs and Sam puts it in coats and takes photos of it and sends like 17 photos at a time to her friends in the text messages. That is the person that she's become. What is the well, point those, of a dog unless you dress it up? Um, you wrote a whole essay called Fuck Dogs in your last so, book, and but you get to grow. You get dogs. to grow. Okay. It is still Fuck Dogs on my life, but the pandemic happened these motherfuckers around here are getting on my nerves and I needed to get them something to distract them. And so the dog is perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. We'll, ta- we'll, 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 we'll talk, we'll get it. We'll talk, we'll talk more about it. Okay. The, um, but the, the question about routine, I would love to um, also throw you all at the, um, at the blog of the essayist Kiese Lehman, L-A-Y-M-O-N mm-hmm. is a fantastic piece on there called we're not good enough to not practice. It's a quick piece. It's like a page long. I have it tacked to the wall. I look at it every day. Whenever I don't want to write, whenever I just want to drink beer and watch The Simpsons, like I, I look at that on my wall and I'm like, oh, he's sitting at home making work. He's standing up. Um, so that that piece has been really, really helpful for me. Um, this, this question is my whole heart. This is my whole heart. Um, uh, oh my God. And it just disappeared. Oh, here. Should old people that haven't written a book yet still try to write or just throw in the towel. And by old, I mean my age, 47. No, throw in the towel. I am 45. No. I'm just getting going. We're just getting going. We need all yeah. of the voices, all of them. Okay. Yes, please. Let Thank me you. say something. Cause this, okay. this is a thing that I try to do in my books I try to like demystify everything but like I know that like 30 under 30 list just came out and you see those things and you're like fuck it's over for me and yes we live in a culture that like prizes youth over everything 
but young people, I mean, they're good at what they're good at, but like you have experience and you have all these experiences and shit can happen anytime. So yes, if you want to do it, you should do it. Uh, what I would say, and this I would say to anyone is to adjust your expectations. I feel like that's what gets people fucked up is when they're like, you know, why don't I have this? But if you write for you first, and I always write for me first, and I have been lucky that like editors or publishers or whatever have have eventually wanted to buy it. But I spent like, you know, 12, 15 years like blogging in obscurity before literally anything happened. And my first book was on an indie and I made no money from it, but it was like a tangible book and like things, my agent, but I didn't have an agent for the first book. My current agent just found me from that book. It's just like, I had no idea that was gonna happen. I just wrote shit to make myself laugh and make my friends laugh. And then it like snowballed into something else. But no, yes, you should absolutely write. Don't throw in the towel. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of questions here about where people can find Sam's blog. So um, Sada, if you're, if you're here, can you drop, oh, there it is right there. I just saw it bounce into the chat. So Sam's blog is right there into the chat. I'm going to give us one more question right now. Thank you all so much for all of your questions. Yeah, this is incredible. One more time, but th this, just this last one, this is my favorite question. So I want to make, I want to make sure that, that we hit it. Um, and it's, what are you reading right now? So Sam, do you want to take oh. it? And then I'm going to hit it. Yes. I would love to show people, but I, uh, well, everybody get ready. I'm not wearing real clothes. Oh my God. This is the greatest moment of my whole life. Oh, I don't think anyone saw anything. Hopefully you didn't. I know. Do it um, again so we can see. Ah. I'm reading The Secret Life of Church Ladies by Disha Filia. We are doing an event tomorrow. If you want to hear me talk two days in a row, I can't imagine why you would, but um, we are going to talk about her book with books and books. I'll post a link on Instagram or Twitter or whatever. So I'm reading this. It's so good. She was nominated for a fucking national book award, which is real shit. Um, yeah. So that's what I'm reading. What are you reading? Um, so the book that I've been carrying around just everywhere I go for the just the past year, it is completely shredded. It's a mess, but it's called The Book of Delights by Ross Gay. Oh, and Kristen it loves that. Loves it. So he he realized that he didn't have enough like delight in his life. So he gave himself an assignment on his birthday for one year. Every day he was gonna write a really short essay, just even a few paragraphs about something that delighted him or that that brought him joy in some kind of a way. And it made me think, I'm, I'm reading a lot of the um, the work of the, the uh, Chicago ed, uh, educator and abolitionist Mariam Kaba. And she talks a lot about how um, hope is a discipline. And so I've been thinking about how joy and delight are, are disciplines. So what does it mean to, to ask myself to look at them a, a little bit every day? And that book has been a, a really great guide. But the main thing I've been reading, you know, I'm working with 20 memoirists right now uh, who are making their own books. And uh, they don't live in the world yet, obviously, because we're still in process, but they blow me away every single day. So everybody who's sitting on this call right now and you're like, oh, I don't know if I should try or I don't know if it, like, maybe I'm too old or maybe I'm too young or maybe I, maybe I haven't lived enough yet. Like what you have been through matters. I, I really think that as, as things are kind of falling down and breaking down around us, it is difficult to live in this moment, but it's also really profound to think about what we're going to rebuild in its place. And I think that our, our personal stories have something to do with that. So what might it mean to turn off this call with us and to just sit down to a piece of paper and say, hey, this is something that I've lived. This is something that I've seen. This is something that matters because uh, that's going to be a part in what we do. We should teach a class, man. Um, do you want to teach a class with me? I can make that happen. Yeah, I do it for free. It's just fun. Okay, great. I'm going to get paid because I am a single mom supporting a child. So it'll be great. Uh, well, now I'm a... 
black woman supporting a dog. So <laughs> yeah, so you're gonna get paid too. I'll get paid. We'll we'll, we'll get paid. We'll get paid. We'll, you gotta we'll set it up. I'll be we'll, there. It's okay. You great. I'll do it. it up. I'll do it. Um, I, I can straight. <laughs> I'm I'm seeing students of mine in the chat. Like, first of all, I get like, are you busy? Two weeks on Tuesday. Like we can t- like we can oh, make you it want happen. Me to sit in? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Did okay. Caldwell's class. Okay. Was- great. Fantastic. So we'll do that. <laughs> We can schedule that later. Like we'll get into the calendars at a different Look time. Look for our forthcoming class. Fantastic. Um, Sam. will teach you real stuff and I'll just cheerlead in the background. Um, you're going to remember February 1, 2021. I need the first essay for your next book in my inbox. Um, you're real pretty when you make that fucking face at me. Y'all, thank you so much for being here. We are so, so happy that you joined us. We love the Black Mountain Institute. Um, Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, this is great. Megan, Sam, thank you, thank you, thank you. What a way to close out our season. As a reminder, if you can buy copies of Sam's most recent Wow No Thank You and Megan's latest is The Wrong Way to Save Your Life. The Believer Magazine's last comics workshop of 2020 is this Friday, December 4th. Thank you for joining us and have a good night.